I'm Nicola Talent and you're watching Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs and the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you can be the first to watch all our latest episodes. You can also listen wherever you get your podcasts. <coughs> it was Cloda there just telling us we could get going that we're recording. Yeah. She's on the oat milk. Yeah. And Very good. <laughs> Yeah. And we had a discussion with the lady. Yeah. Not in, initiated by me. Frank and I on the yeah. coffee company downstairs. Yeah. Not initiated by you, but we had a discussion about the three coffees regarding the oat milk latte, your supersized cappuccino yeah. 17th of the day. Yeah. And my delicate black yeah. coffee. Yeah. And we discussed the calories in them. Yeah, you did. Yeah. And... It was suggested to you yeah. that you should by who? Who's the suggest? By move on to the oat milk, which is sixty-one calories compared to your like. I think it was a hundred and something. Was it one hundred and sixty? Yeah. Per cappuccino. Yeah. And what, like, why would why would I want to do that? I didn't. That wasn't fully made. And you there. also, and I know it's a Friday and I bought you yeah. a treat. <laughs> have your Yorkie gone yeah. in one one go? One go. Yeah, but you see, another one for you. Do you want? You to have to bear in mind, Nicola. If I like, if I looked any. Train if I looked any better, Nicola, yeah. I might not just be able to walk down the street without any hassle. You might not get the uh, the comments. That you do. <clears throat> no, well, I might not. I might be so hassled if I looked any more gorgeous. <laughs> I would just wouldn't be able to go about my normal business. So I'm, tr- I'm trying to just keep myself at a reasonable No level. chance of going on the oat milk. <laughs> but <laughs> there's a chance. There yeah, is a chance. I'll keep you updated, you know. Okay. And... My lifestyle, my own lifestyle podcast might start where I... Which, which is going to because, as Cloda pointed out to us, one of our avid listeners yeah. has suggested that actually it should be the Niall Donald show. I, but I, right? said, I said that's not oh, yeah. that's not fair. I said it'd be Niall Donald and sidekick show. I, I'd still have you. But what would happen would in the be... the background. I would sulk and say nothing. So let's try exactly. that. Exactly. No, no, no. It's it's it, the, the, not, not quite yet. But the Niall Donald and sidekick show, I think, could be really popular. Stop, Nicola. You'd have to fill that. <laughs> you'd have to fill that white noise. You would. Um, anyway, look, it's good that uh, you're getting encouragement like that. Yeah. Um, but you should really consider the maybe the amount of the cappuccinos you drink per day. Well, I'd be. I'm afraid. You're wide awake now. You were practically had to bring it down to get you. <laughs> well, I go into. I go into an underdose quite quickly. Caffeine look, underdose. Look, it's Friday. Do you remember I used to goof off every Friday? I do. I do. Every Friday I afternoon. Do. I do. Yeah. It's like an illness. It is. It is. I just couldn't kind of keep any concentration past about 3 p.m. in the day. It, it I'm does. better now. You are better. Mm. It does get harder towards the end of the week, you know. It definitely does. Anyway, so we want to talk today about something completely different, which is the US sanctions on some of our criminal friends and uh, what they mean and how they've been widening and uh, the other characters involved in this super cartel and beyond it, beyond it that have also been sanctioned. Um, it's April of 2021 and we're now into July of 2023. Yes. And despite the sanctions, despite the wanted posters, Daniel Kinahan, his father, his brother, Sean McGovern, who's wanted in this country for murder, and others remain kicking back in the United Arab Emirates. And the fact of the matter is, I think there's an increasing awareness that uh, there are Kinahan political connections in the Emirates, their connections with certain members of royalty are securing their continued freedom. And unless something changes, are, you know, Look, things can pivot very easily, as we know, in the criminal underworld, but um, that's where they'll remain. Now, I had a very interesting discussion, and we're going to have to have a listen to it, and then we, we'll come back and we'll have a chat with uh, Italian journalist Floriana Bulfin, and she has written, amongst other many 
things she has done. And she's a very well-known journalist in Italy covering the mafias. She's written a new book called Macro Mafia. And she sent me a copy of it. It's in Italian. Yeah. Um, so, but I have translated and she. I've had a discussion with her. And what I did was I did a Q&A with her. Like I sent her questions and she was able to come back to me on it. So it was the easiest way rather than bring in a Zoom with the language and ourselves here in studio and etc. So we're going to have a little listen to some of what she has to say and what's in this book, um, which concentrates on Raphael Imperiale, the uh, creation of the European Super Cartel, which of course includes Daniel Kinahan and Eden Gassanen uh, and Ridwan Taghi, and her thoughts really on... The internationalisation of, of of Europeans' drug gangs, really. Exactly, and, and where they have to go. Yeah. So we'll just have a little listen to what she has to say and then we'll come back. What do you believe each of the partners of the European Super Cartel brought to that union? as their speciality, like what did Imperiale offer Gassanen, Kinahan and Taghi? Well, uh, first of all, together they were able to offer a larger market. Each of them had the control of their their own clans and dealing on the territory. And thus they were able to handle larger import volumes at lower prices. Uh, the same policy of large distribution, which I believe Imperiale knew well through his family's beverage business. Uh, I believe Keenan had the best financial network to invest the capital, while Imperiale was able to collect and move the cash to pay for the cocaine in South America, mm. as, well as, as well as having a logical a logistical network, uh, trucks, uh, car, warehouses, uh, uh, to deliver the drug within Europe. Uh, Ridwan Taghi and, um, to a lesser extent, uh, Edin Gajanin uh, had the keys to the ports, uh, in particular uh, the ports of Europe. Mm. That's a good way of putting it, the keys to the ports, because it's literally what they had, practically. Um, yeah. So what about Imperiale and a bit of background? Where did he come from? Maybe when did he first come on your radar? Uh, Raffaele Imperiale comes from a family of entrepreneurs. He was born in Castellamare di Stabia. He's a city at the foot of uh, Vesuvio Vulcan. Uh, Castellamare di Stabia has an old industrial tradition. His father was a building constructor and built an entire district that bears his name. Uh, he diversified into catering and distribution, uh, entrusting Raffaele's older brother uh, with the capital to open two pre- uh, premises in Amsterdam. The father, the father has never been charged in any criminal activities but he was at the top of the local football team together with the top clan boss in Castellamare di Stabia. Uh, Raffaele stated that he learned his passion from heart and painting from his father. His father. Mm. Um, when Raffaele was a teenager, um, there was an attempt to kidnap him. It was n- never clear whether the, for ransom or uh, revenge. Um, this situation uh, conditioned him. He has developed an obsession with security. When his brother died, uh, he started managing the two Dutch clubs at a very young age. And, the re- and he, there his rise began, supplying one of the two Camorra groups engaged in the war in Secondigliano. The war in Secondigliano is Gomorra story. Mm. So is he a member of the Camorra? And not he, a, no. No, not, not at all. It, it, he's a broker, but he's not uh, really a member. But with his job, he, he supply the, the Camorra group. Probably a very big question, but, you know maybe the most, the best known, but a brief overview of the different mafias in Italy and which one he supplied to being the Camorra uh, group. 
It's a big question, but well, the, <laughs> yeah, the three historical Italian organizations, so Cosa, Cosa Nostra in Sicily, the Ndrangheta in Calabria, and the Camorra in Campania, um, no longer have a top structure that arbitrates drug purchases. Even in the Ndrangheta and the Calabrian Mafia, um, certainly the, the strongest and uh, with the largest uh, international ramification, they uh, bosses procure co coke uh, autonomously, and this is even more the case between the um, Naples clans and the Sicilian ones. Mm. The latter match uh, weakened uh, by the, ac um, the action of the investigation. Uh, Imperiale started out as the exclusive supplier of uh, this family in Secondigliano, probably the, the richest drug market in, in Italy, and then extended its role to other groups in the campaign, of course, uh, or at, in the rest of Italy, for example, in Milan, uh, uh, independent of organized crime. In the last period, according to the investigation, he had made a long-term pact with important families of the Andrangheta, exploiting the, re the, um, the relation they had in the port of Gioia Tauro in Calabria region, uh, Gioia Tauro is one of the main containers terminal in the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. You spoke to me about this incredible story of Bruno Carbone and his kidnapping yeah. in Syria. Could you, could you tell me about that for, for the, the purpose of the podcast? Uh, the story is still mysterious. Um, the hypothesis is that uh, after the arrest of Raffaele Imperiale and Edinga Giannini in, in Emirates, Carbone had realized that the Emirates were no longer safe and was looking for a new base of operation to direct the, the drug trade. He was probably probing the, the situation in Turkey, but realized also there were great risks and want to move in South America to, want to move to South America. Um, his escort uh, had promised him that he could leave uh, Damascus uh, without any problems. But uh, on the way, something went, went wrong. Either it, he, he took a, a wrong turn or um, someone sold him out. The fact is that at the end, uh, he ended up in the hands of the jihadist uh, formation, jihadist group, near to Al-Qaeda group. Mm. And did anyone pay the ransom that was sought for him? Uh, this is also another enigma. <laughs> uh, there is talk uh, of an uh, auction in which Carbone was put up uh, for sales of the highest bid. He alleged there to push his contact in the Camorra to offer a payment. At the end, Italian intelligence prevailed. prevailed. Uh, with the collaboration of the um, Emirates Intelligence Secret Service, which remains very active in that part of Syria. But mm. it's not clear whether the quid pro quo for his release was only financial or included something else, uh, maybe a sort of recognition of uh, um, a, a guy that stayed with uh, Bruno Imperiale, a Dutch guy, Hanas uh, Zamuri. Mm -hmm. It's an extraordinary story. Do you think it's a it's a warning to those still hiding out in the United Arab Emirates and considering where they can run to next? Definitely. Yeah. Uh, today, there is the impression that the narcos are divided between those who believe that the hard line of the Emirates is only temporary and those who believe that it's, uh, it is necessary to find another base of operation. Uh, one that guarantees the same quality of life and uh, also financial services. But there are not many. Beirut mm. is in ruins with banks on the verge of collapse. In Turkey, inflation is too, and, and it is also the pressure of the high security apparatus. Hong Kong is in the hands of China. There are not many alternatives. Maybe Singapore uh, or Brazil. But it's, it is too early to say. I think that Hinan has probably already found it. You think? <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Yeah, his options are small. I'm not sure Kinahan would settle nicely in Iran or somewhere like that, but Maybe. we'll see. Um, so we will what, see. <laughs> what sort of information is Imperiale giving up at the moment? Um, the Italian prosecutors have released only a few reports with the imperial statements, uh, all of which focus on relation with the Campania and the Camorra clans. This may be due to the fact that only those revelations of interest uh, trial in Italy have been selected mm. and does not exclude that he has spoken also about uh, something else. The impression is that so far he has confirmed the elements already gathered by the Italian investigators, adding little else. He does not seem to have spoken about, for example, money laundering channels, or about, nor about his relations with other godfathers. And indeed, he has not left prison, so it takes time. So do you think he will give information on the Kinahans, which may be of use here in Ireland or elsewhere? Um, yeah, it's possible. It's necessary to understand a little better about derogatories, uh, but it's possible. But it takes time. Okay. And um, you spoke to me about cash becoming a commodity in itself and, you know, it's a value to those who trade it. Can you explain a bit of that? Um, well, all illegal activities require untrustable payments. Uh, a cash remains the best instrument, although the, the four brokers that I uh, wrote in, in the book were also trying to use uh, cryptocurrencies. Handling millions in cash across continents requires a, a strong and powerful financial network which is useful not only for drug uh, traffickers, but also for grand corruption and tax fraud. Uh, only a few in the West are able to offer tens of millions in cash where they are needed. Uh, this activity is currently a monopoly of Chinese organization, which are also used by Italian mafia, for example, but only for amounts of less than two or three million. Imperiale and his buddies, uh, on the other hand, can offer larger amounts. This system involves spending money through long chains of transfers and clearing the mechanism with intermediaries in the various uh, countries. Do you believe that Europe is properly recognizing the power of these mafias? Uh, no, I don't think that Europe has understood the power of uh, these mafias. Uh, the hundreds of tons of cocaine that land in Northern Europe ports such as Rotterdam, Antwerp, and Hamburg requires an extraordinary and even more coordinated response, which mm. specialized investigation departments at the European level and the common anti-mafia law. Uh, but they do not not seem to want to take note of the threat and uh, react accordingly. Uh, the Netherlands, for example, thinks it can defeat uh, its new mafias with whole tools. Uh, yes. It's an illusion. It's an illusion. Mm. And no one asks as, uh, how dangerous is the injection of the capital collected by these gentlemen into the legal economy of strong countries as well as the more vulnerable ones. Mm. I, I believe that, uh, for example, heading Gajan in can buy half of Bosnia. Mm. It's frightening, really, what, what, how quickly they're growing. Um, do you think this European yeah. super cartel members, the people in it, the likes of Taggy, Imperiale, Kinahan, do you think they're unique? Or do you think oh. there's many more out there that could come together? Really, I'm afraid that they might be the pioneers of a new mafia age. At the end of the Middle Age in Italy, the, the captains of fortune, uh, how were at the head of the mercenaries were replaced by bankers, equally unscrupulous, but uh, at least more presentable. Mm. I believe something similar is happening in the new mafias. The, the old bosses, military leaders, could be replaced by brokers, whose power is rooted, uh, whose power is rooted as well as uh, uh, acquainted with uh, financial management. Yeah. So what's it like working as a crime journalist in Italy? 
um, it's not easy. Mm, the threats can be physical at legal too. Uh, you can be sued in criminals as well as the civil court in uh, slaps, intimidations. So with huge legal costs, impossible to bear. Uh, nonetheless, uh, as far as physical threats go, I have to acknowledge a, a, a fairly good level of protection is provided for the institution. Unlike the case, for example, of uh, Peter de Vries, uh, the reporter in the Netherlands. Mm. Uh, I'm currently under the police protection, watched over by policemen or carabinieri in the whereabouts. Every time I enter or leave my house or uh, whenever I go to public events or to some particular areas. Right now, there is also an ongoing trial against a mafia organization of Roma origin, something like the Peaky Blinders for the TV series, operating yeah. in Rome, operating in Rome um, where I live. Uh, when I went to report about the street, they had uh, turned into their own property. The moment that the cameraman and I arrived, we were attacked with uh, clubs. So this is the situation in Italy. It's not easy. So one of the first questions that Floriana answered there was a bit about bit the background of Imperiali, which is interesting. We didn't know that before, that he was the son of a yeah. significant character yeah. in organised crime. So he's a bit like Daniel. Exactly like Daniel. Um, not somebody who grew up without access to any money or access to any uh, sort of, uh, you know, status within society. Obviously, she describes Imperiali's father there as being somebody associated with criminal figures rather than having any convictions. Very different than Christy Kinnahan Sr., who obviously did have convictions and spent a, a lot of time in, in prison. But I suppose they're both coming from a certain background yeah. and maybe uh, starting off with this ambition. This and belief, having connections there having as connections. a result of their father's friends and yeah. you know, business. And also yeah. just that sense that there is money to be made and that, yeah. you know, that there is proper power and influence to be gained, you mm-hmm. know. Mm-hmm. Um, definitely that that is an interesting an interesting thing and the kidnap the idea that he was he was kidnapped as a child and that as a young person and he has been so security conscious I mean of course these guys live on a different sort of level than us they will always sit with their back to the wall and be watching and and they're actually at a level that they don't have to probably really watch themselves because they do have security around them and constantly with them and they've had spotters certainly the Kinahan organization have had spotters on the go since well into the early noughties yeah. Um, and that's the way they live and they get used to it. It's not not okay for them. And they're already from Imperiale and, and Daniel Kinnan are already from their or mid-20s. They're already really thinking internationally. Yeah. I mean, they're both moving in. They're both obviously started off in, in the Netherlands, really. Um, but like straight away, they're they're because of their connections and they're straight away into a, a sort of different world and the idea of being a big fish, you know, in, in Dublin City or certain parts of inner city, like they have that that ambition. I think that's because they have the sense that wealth can come behind them, you know. Mm-hmm. The story of Bruno Carboni that I asked Floriana to tell us about is interesting on a number of levels. Firstly, he realised he wasn't safe in United Arab Emirates. He was afraid of the facial recognition which he believed was being used in Turkey. So in order to get to Turkey, he had to travel through Syria. Yeah. Um, a very dangerous region for anybody. And while in Syria, gets kidnapped by essentially the remnants of Al-Qaeda yeah. and is held for ransom. I mean, it's something I suppose we don't really think of, but these guys are like rich kids. I mean, for these terrorist groups that they're mingling with, for these territories that they're kind of traveling through and doing business in, they are, you know, they are like going to be absolutely seen as fodder for raising funds. I mean, they can be kidnapped and they can be held for ransom for millions and millions and millions. And nobody can say a government is going to step in, usually, or that... Uh, it won't be paid or it can't be paid because of course it can be paid. And I think this is the other talk of, obviously she speaks about where they're going to go, if they're going to go somewhere else next, mm-hmm. but this is the reality of some of these countries where they possibly will be safe from extradition or law enforcement, international law enforcement. But once you're in these countries, it's just a totally, the different rules apply. Um, you know, obviously the, the Syria has been a route for for drugs through from Afghanistan 
uh, have come through Syria and and maybe these uh, mil- mil- militant groups will sometimes take money and allow smuggling through their territory, but they're not, you know, they're not going to operate by any particular rules. And this mm-hmm. is obviously why he got himself in trouble. He probably got some sort of nod that he was going to be safe. Then all of a sudden, that's not yeah. the case, you know? No, somebody, these people, I mean, you're not dealing with honest brokers here. No, you're you? not. And, the, you know, they have the, um, the you know, Syria is obviously at some point over the last long number of years has broken down further and further. Mm. And that, you know, if people have talked about different places that the Kinnans could end up, like, you know, even somebody was saying Afghanistan, but, you know, they're not safe there. And no. I keep going back to Homelands, which I'd love you to watch mm. because it, it is a fantastic um, series and, you know, it is all set in these regions and about the double crosses and, yeah. you know, um, it's it's fascinating. And, and the DEA and the CIA, of course, are in and they have informants yeah. and they have... Information is traded as a commodity. Yeah. I mean, information is valuable. And we'll come back to that a little bit maybe uh, next week about the value of that information. But um, what I was going to say was, you know, it's interesting what Floriana says about the Emirates, that there's this kind of division of, you know, within the underworld, there's certain people who believe that the Emirates is still a safe zone, that this supposed crackdown on organised crime is really just a show and that they're going to go back to normal anytime soon, that it's all just to keep the international community happy. And I definitely think that there is that sense here in Ireland that, I mean, when you look at the Kinnahans, when you look at how... Uh, certainly Sean McGovern so far there's already charges against him Um, we believe that Daniel Kinahan will very soon be facing charges here in this country I think he's coming here I think this is where he's ultimately wanted I don't think Daniel Kinahan is going to the States perhaps his brother or his father might end up there but I think that the amount of work and policing that has gone in to um, you know, to him, to his organisation here, I think there will be an end result soon that there could be charges before the courts from very serious charges here. Yeah. So we will want him here. Yeah, I think he, I think the op, the Irish operation of the Kinnan cartel like is is subject to guarded investigations and what has happened in this country beyond the, the sort of international drug trafficking aspect that Daniel Kinnan is involved, there's no doubt the Gardaí are actively investigating him here. Um, it's then it becomes a matter of sort of geopolitics, doesn't it? Mm. Now you see the Americans, as as you said, um, they're sanctioning people. I mean, the American government are obviously the the world's number one superpower for the moment, anyway. Yeah, and they're laying sanctions on really on the leaders of this European super cartel. We had Eden Gasson in in recent months, and we had three more people added this week. From, from Belgium. From Belgium. Mm, from Antwerp. From Antwerp. Really, these guys, um, I don't know if you can pronounce their names, can you? But uh, I'll, I'll give it a go. Um, you know, the, the names um, are Ottoman El Baloudi. Mm-hmm. So he is regarded as being the, the controller of the port of... Antwerp. The port of Antwerp, which is maybe the biggest distribution hub for cocaine in Europe or certainly one of them. It and Rotterdam are the two biggest entry points. So there's three guys, um, uh, El Baloudi, his younger brother and another associate were all added to the same sanctions list that the Kinnans have been on. Um, they're all based in Dubai as well and they were regarded as controlling that that port. Obviously their their connections in with the super cartel really come through the the, the Dutch criminals. The Dutch criminals because as as Floriana says, you know, you look at uh, the Dutch, you look at Rudy and Taggy. Yeah. And he has what he brings to the table is the keys to the ports. Yeah, and these are the these are his guys on the ground. Mm. I mean, they're obviously now in Dubai and they've they but that is what they were that is how they made their their fortune. So they've been added to this sanction list and the Americans have added all of these people that are in or around the the, the Kinnahans, including some in sort of Central America. Um, and that's, I suppose, as much as sanctioning their operations in the US, it's a it's an attempt to put, I would imagine, to put pressure on, on officials in Dubai that these are pe- persona non grata, that, you know, they're making it public that these people are are wanted, like it's literally 
wanted on the on the poster that they put out this week. Um, and I'd say that's all an attempt to put pressure on 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 them to stop. No doubt. Direct- I mean, no doubt. It's it's seeing you know it's seeing America stand shoulder to shoulder with Europe against this threat of organised crime, of course, which is funding Hezbollah, which is, you know, linked into Iran, which is this massive big terrorism issue. It's it's terrorism and the narco-terrorists as such coming together, trading in money, trading in people, trading in guns, in drugs, and ultimately funding more. Yeah, I mean, (laughs) the only, the broader question is, you know, that pressure from the US, is it as, is it as, uh, you know, all powerful as it once would have been in the Gulf. You know, are there other forces at work there? You know, the level of wealth, of course, in that section of of the world now, does that allow them to resist a bit of that US pressure? And does that play in then to the, to where they're maybe less uh, receptive to US pressure as they once would have been, uh, you know, now that you have the influence of countries like China and countries like like Russia, I mean, remember a lot of the the wealth. Forget about our own organized crime. A lot of the the, the Russian wealth that 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 has been sanctioned in in Europe and the US has ended up in that part of the world mm. freely as well. Um, but if we look at what we look at our European super cartel and its existence being confirmed, really, the day yeah. of Daniel Kinahan's wedding, yeah, because everybody was there in the Burj Al Arab having a good time, DEA were watching. The first to be to be picked up was Ridwan Taghi yeah. in, in late 2019. And he was sent back to the Netherlands pretty seamlessly, yeah. it has to be said. Uh, El Rico, his business partner, was in San Diego in Chile. When he was arrested, yeah. When he was arrested and sent back again pretty seamlessly. Now, I think Taghi, from memory, was living under a false identity there. And with a false passport, he was wanted uh, in the Netherlands. Next up, we had uh, Rafael Imperiale. Yeah. Yeah. And there was a bit of messing with that because he was picked up yeah. and then he wasn't sent back. The Italians were accused of messing up the extradition papers, which they said they didn't. Yeah. He was wanted. He was actually due to be serving time as well as being wanted for directing crime from out there in Dubai. Eventually, the Italian minister had to get on a plane, fly yeah. out to Dubai yeah. and essentially beg the Emirates to send him back, which they did. Yeah. The Italians have him back and he's gone super grass. He's gone yeah. from super cartel to super grass. We'll come back to him and what Floriana has to say about him in a minute. But next we have... Uh, the sanctions against our guys, which we really thought was going to move quicker, that they would be moving in and sending some of them home, certainly McGovern, with the clear murder charge on him. Um, And then you've eaten Gassanin is picked up. And what happened with Gassanin was he was picked up. Now, the sanctions have been levelled against him in March, but he was arrested, right? Uh, Described as one of the world's most prolific drug traffickers by the US Treasury. He had been arrested in the United Arab Emirates, a close ally to Daniel Kinahan, and he was given bail. Yeah. He was. And he is apparently out in bail. You don't let these guys no. out in bail. No. So what is going on in the Emirates? Kinahan, we, is openly living in the Emirates. He's not on the run. No. He's not in uh, Afghanistan. We spoke about the option for them to go to Kish Island, which is a, an interesting place where they've been doing business. And obviously they see as a possible uh, place of sanctuary if they need to leave the United Arab Emirates. But the fact of the matter is they're living pretty much as normal in the Emirates. They remain so in that position. It must be very frustrating for police forces, for probably the DEA and for everybody else to see that the likes of Daniel Kinahan and his father and his brother have such influence over the politics yeah. of the Gulf, of the United Arab Emirates. And, you know, the Emirates are coming constantly to the table saying they're honest brokers, they want to clean up this place, they don't want it to be a sanctuary for, uh, you know, international crime lords, but it is. It absolutely is, and it's absolutely a sanctuary for for dirty money of various types, not just, you know, organised crime and drug money. Um, so... What, you know, what does it cost them? I mean, they certainly do quite a lot of publicity about how they're cleaning up this. They've certainly sent back 
a good number of criminals have been sent less back. Less connected, I would say. Possibly less connected. And I mean, that was the difference, I think, with Daniel Kinnan, was that he had he managed to get roots into into ordinary society, and largely through the boxing, mm-hmm. um, you know, through employing people in that world, through uh, making connections there, through offering the the that part of the world, mm-hmm. sporting uh, opportunities, which of course they've shown as they see, as you see with Premier League football, golf, yeah, you know, so all of that part mm-hmm. has become a big, big part of a big part of the plan for the Emirates and for countries mm-hmm. like Saudi Arabia. So he's got dug into society there, um, and what bad publicity are they getting from? from Daniel Kinnan, they're certainly, if they listen to Crime World, they're getting a lot of bad publicity, but they're not probably listening to Crime World as such. I I actually think that, and I I was told this a number of times by people who who are very much in the know, but that Kinnan, Daniel Kinnan himself, has befriended one of these sort of almost rogue members of the royal family out there who still has the, the, you know, the title and everything and the influence, but it's kind of one of these brattish royals. Yeah. Um, who's a bit of a wild card, and that it's that friendship, it's that link that is is giving the protection. And until something changes with that, or with international relations, or with somebody saying this little bratty guy is no longer going to have his friends protected here, yeah. Until something changes, and listen, it will pivot. These things change, and the wind changes the its direction yeah. very frequently, and that's exactly what will happen ultimately. But at the same time. You know, they're getting extra f- years. We're going into year two yeah. of their freedom since the since the sanctions. The and, and it's it's interesting to hear Floriana there. One of the things she ended on saying, you know, that what's the future for these organisations? And yeah. she's ca- talking about people becoming brokers. Mm-hmm. She sort of says that Raphael Imperiali, and I, in fact, he says it in one of his, his statements that he almost stopped being involved in the drugs business at any particularly heavy way, what he became involved in was the money yeah. and moving money. And that's really what he was doing. Yes. Like the drugs are almost incidental. So he kind of became a specialist, uh-huh. um, you know, and he could do that from Dubai because they, they become big but international. becoming a very valuable commodity, isn't it? Yeah. Because if you saw there, I don't know whether you, you noticed it, but there was a story there about Germany yeah. and the ATM machines in Germany have been hammered by this Dutch gang because yeah. the Netherlands as a as a kind of a, um, a a culture have taken on board a cashless society yeah. and they've removed quite a lot of their ATMs. They literally just don't Use deal them. so much in cash. The Germans are much slower apparently yeah. to give up their cash. They like their cash and there's been a massive surge in ATM robberies over there by Dutch criminal gangs because they need the cash. Yeah. And they've been doing what our guys in the border were doing for a long time. They'll, you know, plant a bomb yeah. and the the uh, cash machine would be literally blown out of the wall and they're taking away up to 100,000 to go. Yeah. Now, apparently in the Netherlands, for the cash machines that have, that do remain, they have created some glue system that if the, the machine is tampered with or it has some sort of emergency button, that a glue is released internally and they end up with a bundle of cash, which is totally oh, worthless. Better. Right, right, right. Better. Yeah, but you see, I think because of the, as these so organizations... Cash is almost becoming a commodity like gold or like a diamond yeah. or... But it's like anything in, in, in you know, in, in journalism or... Airbnb or anything like as as these things become more digitalized and you know more international globalization that there becomes a, a niche for specialities and I think that's what Floriana was yeah. talking about that these <coughs> these guys like like Daniel Kinnan or 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 uh, Raphael Imperiali they can become specialists in one area mm-hmm. and you know these people can can operate as as brokers, as she said, as as somebody who can yeah. you know have the contacts on 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 say in the drugs world or the logistical contacts. And she's talking about some guys like Gassanin and people like that. So mm. they can still do their business from Dubai. Sort of different employment opportunities from here on in. in there is crime. There, it's there like, is. There it's is one of those sort of growth industries, a little bit like. It is. Uh, um, sustainability or something like that. I find yeah. it, there'll be a degree in it now soon. There will, there and, will. Uh, there will be children that's, all over the country looking to study organised crime. That, that is what happens as these, mm. as companies and, and organisations scale up. 
people become specialists in 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 areas marketing or who knows yeah yeah well they've you know? had, they've had those yeah but um you know what struck me and what I didn't realize because I have been speaking to Floriana for quite some time and other journalists around Europe like you know it's very interesting to talk to them and how they find the job and the working environment because it's changing for all of us yeah it is there's it's undoubtedly becoming it's not the sort of job you're going to be able to rattle up to anybody's house again. No. You know, it's, it is it is really changing uh, when you come to the kind of the higher levels of organised crime, I mean. But, I mean, she's living under protection. Yeah. I was quite taken aback by that. I was shocked. Yeah. Um, she's involved in a trial there at the moment, which is to do with intimidation that happened while she was doing her course of doing her job. But she is under protection, leaving her house, coming into her house, going to her work, anywhere she goes. I mean, we know colleagues of ours in the Netherlands are living like that. Yeah. Um, it It is an awful way to have to live. It is not the most attractive uh Job, really, these days? No. Crime journalism I mean, with certainly the higher end of it anyway. No, I mean, if you look at Italy, you know, obviously in the 80s and the 90s, some of the mafia organisations went to war with, with the government, really. I mean, judges were killed, weren't they, on a few occasions? Yeah. I mean, so that they've had that where those criminal organizations became so powerful that they that they were willing to attack society. And, and, you know, that's happened in countries like Mexico as well. There was journalists killed there last week in, in, in Mexico uh, for reporting on drugs gangs. Um, so We have a lot to learn from countries like Italy where, you know, the those mafias are... Like in 2018, I read 200 journalists in Italy were under protection. Yeah. Yeah. Because the mafias turned on them. Yeah. And in particular, the Sicilians. And, you know, yeah. I mean, I actually asked her at one point, you know, uh, what what's the mafia overview yeah. of Italy? Like, <laughs> I mean, stupid question because it is such a giant country and all the rest of it. But we have a lot to learn from one another, how we have fought crimes and how we, yeah. you know, the Spanish have their own problems down on the Costa and in other areas. But they also had that, the, the threat of ETA yeah. in the north. Um, in Ireland here, of course, we have vast experience in subversives, yeah. subversives and terrorism and yeah. that sort of terror threat. Obviously, Belgium has that sort of open port policy or what the drug dealers see as that. There's been a huge amount of uncovering of corruption within the, the structured systems. And, and that has all come out of those EncroChat hacks and the Sky ECC hacks. Um, what I what was very interesting, I don't know whether you noticed it or not, or we whether we used it or edited it, but Joris van der Aa was telling me that in Antwerp, some of those cases from the hackings are coming through the courts. And one of the things that they discovered was there was a criminal organization actually functioning just to provide information. Yeah. But information on people, on anybody within the policing system, within the government, that files on people are a commodity now to organise crime. Yeah. And during a court case, his own name and other journalists he knew were read out as there was files on them. Yeah. Because they were actually worth money to criminal organisations. So, I mean, that's, they're like the, what, the librarians or the, the research. Yeah. And teams. again, it's a kind of a, a specialist that if there's enough money that there be somebody employed to do these things. Um, and again, in, in Italy, you see, and which she refers to that she looked, she looks at the, the the system in Holland not doing enough, maybe, but Italy had to, you know, and is still going through the process of unpicking the roots that mafia organisations had in ordinary society. It's one thing for, you know, for for drug dealers to to exist; they're always going to exist, maybe in organised criminals, but when they become so enmeshed in ordinary society that. The, the, it becomes a problem of corrupting a whole country and corrupting a system. And it's interesting as well because obviously, you know, the more important that is to have people in, involved in ordinary in areas of ordinary society, like do they manipulate somebody who's in there or do they actually place their own people in? And I don't think in Ireland we can sit back and think that that hasn't happened or that isn't happening. Mm -hmm you know, at the moment in this country, we, we we do have this tendency to kind of look outside and think, gosh, you know. Well, we have the bad apples tendency, don't we, in Ireland? Mm -hmm. It's just one, there's a one bad yeah. apple. I mean, that's that's our tendency. 
to, like, be, you to, know, to believe that or to, to kind of write yeah, it off to, as Yeah, that. yeah. So if as opposed to actually looking at the reality yeah, of the situation. So look, I'll tell you, this is the classic, uh, you know, not having a go at the Gardaí because all police organisations will have some level of corruption. and But it's always if somebody is caught doing something. He was just a bad apple. Yeah. The, the actual, the rest of the cart of apples is fine. And that's also true of politicians when there's been corruption. Oh, it's just one bad apple or one bad social worker mm. or one bad judge. Um, the, the system is fine. But it, the system isn't automatically fine. Are the systems fit for purpose going forward to a new era of organised crime and what we're facing? Are the systems fit for purpose of what we had in the past? Possibly. But going forward, every system, every, both policing, the judicial I think everybody has to sit up and relook at how it operates, who it employs, how it can, you know, have that as an open discussion. Exactly. The and is there, is there accountability? Is there accountability I mean, if something goes wrong? To stuff about mindfulness and everything else. So, <laughs> I mean, why aren't we? Why is the reality of the the the, the chances of corruption are being tempted by? dirty money or yeah. whatever, not an open discussion. And and why aren't the government kind of looking at how they can preempt it happening? Okay, the Gardaí have set up their, their I mean, the Gardaí at least corruption have, unit. Yeah, they have been they making have at efforts. Least done that. But I mean, we get... Is it up and running? It, it's certainly, we've well, got uh, to talk about it. Look, I mean, it's... Uh, there is some changes seem to be going about, in fairness, within the Gardaí. And there's a lot but, of... I mean, there's not a... It shouldn't be, but apart from that... There's not a week we doesn't go by that we don't get calls about uh, maybe, you know, organization, other organisations to do with children and mm -hmm. things like that. And we see a report recently about some of the shocking things that are going on uh, regarding children in, in state care. You know, every week I'll get a call from somebody saying this is happening. So look, there's, you know, are we doing enough? I don't think we probably take it seriously in this country. And I think we really fall on the bad, the bad apple theory. Like there's one corrupt county councillor. Oh, that's just one bad guy. But really... I think we're also a very reactive nation. Yeah. And we're not proactive. No. We always, something catastrophic happens and yeah. all of a sudden, and I mean, actually just even look at the RTE thing. Yeah, yeah. Everybody's been talking about it for years, this, you know, how yeah. the money was being spent and the license yeah. fee and da 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 da, da. But, uh, you know, something scandalous sort of has to happen yeah, yeah. before it's... It takes happened. a relatively minor sort of uh, kerfuffle over Ryan Tuberty to, to bring it all out in the air, you know. And even then, of course... Or he fell back on the one bad apple theory and blamed mm -hmm. the Forbes, yep. you know, mm -hmm. um, rather than saying, no, there's the a structural, there's yeah. an institutional problem. And look, the police have been held accountable over in, in recent times more the Gardaí have because of various scandals. I mean, I do look sometimes at some of the other institutions of the state and wonder, you know, how are they going to ever even be held accountable, you know? Mm -hmm. And also, you know, you know, look outwards from the Garda Siakona, they work with other partners as well. Yeah. And there's other partners there, um, you know, that are, you know, social welfare and certainly mm. revenue and yeah. other partners like that that are slushing around with the Criminal Assets Bureau. There's a lot of information yeah. sort of being swapped, exchanged, which is always a good thing. Yeah. But has everybody else got those structures in place that the Garda have brought in the Vice and Corruption Unit and all the rest of it? Is everybody else at the table thinking... You know, yeah. I mean, if somebody looks up something in in if the guard if a guard looks something up on Pulse, there's a record of somebody looking something up. Um, and I mean, there's blue murder if they're not looking it up for a good reason. Yeah. And, and does that exist in other government bodies? You'd wonder. I mean, are those checks in place? And like, while we the guards are the first to be criticised for all this sort of stuff, maybe they actually have more checks than other people. Maybe they do. We certainly don't know uh, mm. because people is there accountability for what happens in some of the other bodies of the state. You know, it's a, mm. I don't know. So, um, what's next? Well, you're off on holidays, are you? I'm not, yeah, kind of, a little yeah. bit. Well, wouldn't, I'd be around, shall we say. Be around. And I suspect Yeah. you might be phoning me, maybe. Maybe. You're allowed, you're not allowed to stalk me. <laughs> phone me, as always. Um, what about you? Are you going to jog off the cappuccinos tonight? No, I'm... I, okay. Yeah, no, I'm not looking forward to a week off from personal comments on air, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I bet you Eamon Dillon doesn't keep you he in doesn't, check like I do. He does not. He yeah. doesn't. He doesn't. He's much more mutually supportive. Yeah. 
You uh, just don't discuss anything personal at all. It's <laughs> probably too no, no, no. Yeah, but anyway, yeah, he, um, he, as if I'm talking to the listeners there, uh, was, yeah, we were told that he should have his own show and that he's such a good guy and... Uh, yeah, the Niall Donald show with, Donald Donald with show. Sidekick. With Sidekick Nicola yeah. Donald. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How does that sound? Sidekick, your one, Nicola maybe your even. One. You What's her name again? Name. Oh. What's That's, your one saying? It doesn't matter what You know the one. The, Niall Donald and the lady. <laughs> ah, your one will do, would it? <laughs> your one, yeah. The mouty one. So yeah, anyway, we as we don't usually uh, look at most comments, do we? But Clodagh keeps an eye on some of the funny, the funny ones. ones. And we do, we, do, we do get great amusement as well from a lot of them, don't we? We do. Well, we, she doesn't send the, the abusive ones. No, she gets rid of the nasty, nasty, but, nasty ones but, mostly. Well, when she does that in her spare time as well. So yeah. maybe if you try and keep the nasty stuff in your own head and not yeah. write it down, it'd save Clodagh some extra work. But um, yeah, for the moment, I think we, I have a funny feeling we might be busy next week. And, we might be. Uh, that's because of my status on Hall's Snooze Hill. Won't you take a couple of days off? It yeah. all kicks off. Yeah, just stick, stick my uh, do not disturb notice on the phone. Yeah. And uh, I'll allow you ring if there's an emergency. If there's an emergency. All right. Okay. Bye. Thank you, Nicola.